Good afternoon. I'm Catherine Santoro, Director of Policy and Development at the National Institute for Healthcare Management, or NICM Foundation. I'm pleased to welcome you today to this webinar, Expanding Nutritional Counseling to Prevent Childhood Obesity. We are all too aware of our nation's childhood obesity crisis. In the past 30 years, childhood obesity has more than doubled in children and tripled in adolescents. These children and youth are at an increased risk of developing diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and cardiovascular disease. While many factors place children at risk for being overweight, we know that improving eating habits and increasing access to healthy food for women and children can help reduce this risk and set children on a path toward lifelong health. <clears throat> Multi-sector partnerships are key to changing behaviors and environments, and today we've convened a panel of expert speakers to discuss approaches to reducing childhood obesity through an increased focus on improving nutritional guidance for children, youth, and their parents. I'd like to recognize Claire Rudolph, Nickham's Research and Policy Analyst, who led the development of this event today, and also thank other Nickham staff who helped organize today's webinar, including Katie McDonald, Amanda Parker, and Carolyn Myers. You can find short bios for our speakers today, a resource list of additional materials, and slide copies on our website, www.nihcm.org, on the Maternal, Child, and Adolescent Health Corner under the Conferences and Webinar tab. An archive of today's webinar, including slides and audio, will also be available on our website within the next week. Those of you joining us by phone will have an opportunity to ask questions following the presentation, but please feel free to submit questions of our presentation. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize HRSA's Maternal and Child Health Bureau for their support of NICM. Our partnership with MCHD spans 17 years and has fostered numerous public-private partnerships to improve maternal and child health. We're so fortunate to have Dr. Michael Liu, Associate Administrator of the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, with us today to share his perspective and the Maternal and Child Health Bureau's work in this area. Dr. Liu? Thank you, Catherine, and hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to join you all on today's uh, webinar. I'd like to thank the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation for focusing on this very important issue and for their ongoing partnership in promoting the health of our nation's women, children, and families. Promoting healthy weight in women and children continues to be an important area of focus for the Maternal Child Health Bureau. The health of the child population is reflective of the overall health of our nation and has many implications for the nation's future as children grow into adults. Health habits established in childhood often continue throughout the life course, and many health problems, such as childhood obesity, influence health into adulthood. MCHV has a longstanding interest and involvement in promoting nutrition and healthy weight for women and children. A few highlights of our efforts include supporting the Institute of Medicine report, weight gain during pregnancy, reexamining the guidelines and subsequent implementation project. Among the report's recommendations, is that federal, state, and local agencies, as well as care providers, should inform women of the importance of conceiving a normal BMI, supporting pregnant women in gaining weight within the guidelines, and assisting them in achieving healthy weight postpartum. MCHB promotes breastfeeding, in particular, through our Healthy Start and Home Visiting programs, and the state Title V MCH programs also report annually on national performance measures related to breastfeeding and early childhood overweight and obesity. In 2010, the most priority area identified by states in their needs assessment was healthy eating, nutrition, and breastfeeding. MCHB is also launching a maternal health initiative to reduce maternal morbidity and mortality, which includes promoting and implementing recommendations and guidelines for improving maternal health before, during, and beyond pregnancy. Since 1990, MCHB has supported Bright Futures to improve the quality of health services for children through health promotion and disease prevention. The centerpiece of this effort is the Bright Futures Guidelines for Health Supervision. Developed in partnership with the American Academy of Pediatrics, these guidelines provide a framework for well child care from birth to age 21. 
Bright Futures recommends that primary care health providers measure length, height, and weight at each of the 31 well child visits beginning in the newborn period to age 21 years, calculate weight for length at each visit until age 24 months, and calculate BMI at every visit. The Bright Future guidelines also recommend anticipatory guidance counseling for health promotion and prevention at every visit throughout infancy, childhood, and adolescence. There is also a Bright Future Nutrition Implementation Guide for providers. MCHB is also investing in training leaders in nutrition by providing graduate education training in MCH Nutrition through the Leadership in Education in MCH Nutrition Training Program. We're establishing centers of excellence to promote both clinical and public health approaches to working with pediatric and maternal populations. I also wanted to just mention a new investment for us, the MCH Research Network on Promoting Healthy Weight, which will improve our understanding of the factors contributing to the possible increased risk of overweight and obesity among children with autism spectrum disorders and other special health care needs. And lastly, I just want to talk about the Affordable Care Act. This is the most important piece of legislation for MCH populations in the last 50 years. We know, for example, that millions of individuals and families are already benefiting from the Affordable Care Act, that there are many opportunities to promote nutrition for women and children and address childhood obesity through the ACA. 17 million children with pre-existing conditions are now protected against discrimination by insurance companies, a life-changing benefit that will extend to adults next year. 3 million previously uninsured young adults between the ages of 18 and 26 are now covered by their parents' plans, providing critically important coverage for young mothers and their children. And children's preventive services, such as regular well baby and well child visits, autism screenings, developmental screenings, immunizations, and much, much more are covered without copay out-of-pocket costs. For infants and children and adolescents, this means that preventive services recommend by the Bright Future Guidelines. The law also provides comprehensive lactation equipment and counseling during pregnancy and postpartum, helping children thrive early in life. Another set of prevention services covered under the ACA are those recommended in the HRSA supported guidelines for women's preventive services. Many important nutrition issues can be addressed and preventive services delivered at covered well woman visits. So as you can see, the implementation of the Affordable Care Act will be very important in ensuring that women and children receive important cover services that can promote health and prevent childhood obesity. So thank you again to the National Institute for Healthcare Management for the important topic of childhood obesity. And thank you to all the health plans and other partners on today's call for the critical work that you are doing to promote child health and wellness across our nation. So let me turn it back to you, Catherine. Thank you so much, Dr. Liu. We're so grateful for your leadership and the Bureau's investments in maternal and child health and promoting nutrition, and we really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Thank you. I'm now pleased to introduce our second speaker, Marcia Schofield, Director of Nutrition Services Coverage at the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Uh, Ms. Schofield is going to explain today why nutrition is so critical to maternal and child health. Um, she will expand on some of the points Dr. Liu just raised uh, regarding provisions of the Affordable Care Act and how um, those, the Affordable Care Act is promoting improvements in nutrition. And she'll also introduce how partnerships are playing a powerful role in preventing childhood obesity. Ms. Schofield? Thank you, Catherine. Once again, I'd also like to thank the Foundation for inviting me to be a part of this webinar because certainly it's a critical topic from the perspective of our organization. And I would like to build on the remarks from Dr. Liu and give you a little bit perspective from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So with a little bit of background, wanted to let you know that for those of you who are not familiar with us, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics is the world's largest organization of food and nutrition professionals, and we are committed to optimizing the nation's health through food and nutrition. So our work definitely focuses on the needs of women and children. 
So as Catherine mentioned, I want to share with you why we view nutrition as a critical component of the health of these populations, highlight in a little bit more detail some of the key provisions of the Affordable Care Act that Dr. Liu alluded to, and also talk about the work we're doing with the Alliance for a Healthier Generation and the benefit that we see in these types of collaborative efforts to address the prevention and treatment of childhood obesity. While everyone needs good nutrition for their overall health and well-being, I think health promotion and chronic disease prevention really begins here in utero. Many chronic diseases with strong ties to nutrition and lifestyle can take decades to develop and can actually begin during infancy or even be linked to the intrauterine environment or the mother's reproductive years. The environment that the mother provides to her developing infant impacts both short-term and long-term health outcomes. I think we all generally recognize some of the short-term impacts of a mother's nutritional status prior to and during pregnancy on things like the growth of the fetus, the development in utero, baby's birth weight, and even their health status at birth. But research also shows that there's a link between the mother's nutritional status during pregnancy and optimal growth and prevention of obesity among children. Maternal obesity has also been linked to increased risk of metabolic syndrome in their offspring. And it doesn't stop there. We also know that poor nutrition during pregnancy, whether you're talking about underweight or obesity in the mother, as well as things like gestational diabetes, can lead to an increased susceptibility to chronic disease such as type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease later in life for not only the mother but the baby as well. As shown on this slide, five of the leading chronic diseases in this country are linked to diet. So we really need to be doing whatever we can to improve the nutritional status of women, not just for their sake, but for the benefit of the future generations. Speaking of those future generations, children's eating habits, both what they eat and how they eat, impact their growth and development in so very many ways. There are obvious ways, such as physical growth. But food choices and appropriate feeding practices also impact a child's emotional development, their performance in school, and even how they behave. So the foundation that's laid during childhood and adolescence in terms of nutrition and food choices predicts future health outcomes. For example, obesity in children predicts obesity in adulthood. Similarly, Risk factors such as total cholesterol, triglyceride, blood pressure, and body mass index, evident as early as age nine, have been shown to be predictive of subsequent heart disease in adulthood. So from the development of obesity and atherosclerosis to the accrual of things like peak bone mass, the diet and physical activity choices made by children have implications for their longevity and their quality of life. In particular these days, and certainly a focus of today's call, is a concern about overweight and obesity in children. And why is that? It's because overweight and obesity is associated with a multitude of other health problems, many of which in the past we really only saw in adulthood. But now we as healthcare providers, healthcare systems, children, families, and just society as a whole, are being faced with the challenges of treating these conditions in younger and younger patients. And once again, it's not just physical ailments, but it extends to psychosocial issues and things like academic performance. And many of these issues persist well into adulthood and carry high costs in terms of morbidity, mortality, productivity, and quality of life. So as Dr. Liu mentioned, the Affordable Care Act is really changing the landscape for maternal and child nutrition. And I think the biggest change that we're seeing under the Affordable Care Act is the fact that health care in our country is beginning to shift away from a sick care system to a system that's focused on preventive care and wellness. So I'd like to share just a few examples of how this paradigm shift is playing out under the ACA. 
One important change is the fact that most insurance plans must now provide support for breastfeeding, which includes coverage for lactation counseling and breastfeeding equipment. And why is this so important? It's because we know that breastfeeding has numerous benefits for both mothers and children. For example, breastfeeding has been shown to promote healthy weights among children. It can help mothers attain a healthy weight after pregnancy, and it can reduce the risk of certain cancers and type 2 diabetes. Beyond the provision for the health plans, the Affordable Care Act also contains a provision to support breastfeeding in the workplace. And this is important because women now comprise half of the United States workforce, and the fastest growing segment of the workforce is women with children under age three. We know that many women who start out breastfeeding their infants stop doing so when they return to work because of an unsupportive environment. Creating a breastfeeding friendly work environment reduces the risk of long-term health problems for women and children, decreases employee absenteeism, reduces health claims to employers, and increases retention of female employees. So under the ACA, the Fair Labor Standards Act was amended to now require employers to provide reasonable break time for an employee to be able to express her breast milk for one year after the child's birth. It also requires employers to provide a place other than a bathroom that's shielded from view and free from intrusion from co-workers and the, pu and the public so that the employee can express her breast milk in a private place. Another provision of the ACA that has far-reaching implications for the nutritional health of women and children is the requirement that most health plans cover preventive services that have received a grade A or B rating by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. Specifically, there are three recommendations that speak to coverage for diet counseling as listed on this slide. One is healthy diet counseling which addresses counseling for adults with risk factors for cardiovascular and diet-related chronic diseases. The other two are for obesity screening and counseling for both adults and children. And registered dietitians can certainly play a critical role in delivering these services in both a clinically and cost-effective manner. There are other provisions for preventive services that impact the nutritional status of women and children, and those are noted on the slides, and Dr. Liu also referenced these in his remarks. These services, as well as the ones I just described, need to be provided at no cost, meaning no co-pays, no deductibles or cost-sharing requirements, to individuals within new group and individual health plans. I also want to mention that under the ACA, as Dr. Liu mentioned, insurers can no longer deny health coverage to children with pre-existing conditions or exclude their conditions from coverage. So this provision should really go a long way toward helping to improve the nutritional health of women and children, especially as we see the incidence of chronic diseases rising in these two populations. The ACA also recognizes the impact of food eaten away from home on the nutritional status of Americans, including women and children. So under the ACA, chain restaurants with at least 20 outlets, as well as food sold from vending machines, need to disclose the calorie content of their items. They have to post calories on menus and menu boards, and that includes drive through windows and then provide additional information on specific nutrients, such as the fat content, protein content, and fiber, in writing if a consumer requests it. In terms of vending machines, they're required to post calorie content of all items that they dispense. I would like to point out that the Academy believes it's not only it's not enough to just provide this information, but consumers also need education to help them understand how to interpret and use this information so they can make the most appropriate food selections. The last area of the Affordable Care Act I want to highlight are the provisions to support worksite wellness programs. The ACA permits employers to offer employees rewards, things like premium discounts and waivers of cost-sharing requirements, 
for employees who participate in a wellness program and meet certain health-related standards. Now, in the case of employees for whom it might be unreasonably difficult or inadvisable to meet the standard, employers have to offer an alternative standard so that these employees can also have the opportunity to, re to earn these rewards. So while worksite wellness programs aren't new, these provisions of the Affordable Care Act have really spurred significant growth of such programs. These programs can take on many different shapes, and they include a variety of components, either alone or in tandem, as I've noted on this slide. I've also highlighted in italics the components of worksite wellness programs that focus on nutrition or might have a nutrition component. So you can see there are many opportunities here. As employers and insurers work together to deliver these programs, I also think it's important to recognize where you draw the line between a nutrition wellness program versus a health benefit, such as medical nutrition therapy. So I think the concept of employers and insurers working together to improve the health of individuals and their families provides a nice segue into the concept of the power of partnerships. One of my roles at the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics is to serve as our liaison with the Alliance for a Healthier Generation's Healthier Generation Benefit. We've been at the table, along with the American Academy of Pediatrics and others, with this wonderful benefit right from the start because we share the vision with all of the partners of eradicating childhood obesity, and we see the Healthier Generation Benefit as an important step in doing so. Why do we need everybody on the table or at the table in the first place? Well, basically, there's just no quick fix to the obesity epidemic. A variety of factors have come together to create the problem, and it's going to take a variety of components or sectors of influence to come together to try to solve it. So the Academy supports the Healthier Generation Benefit because we believe, as does the Institute of Medicine, that we need to bring together providers, employers, and insurers to work together to prevent and treat childhood obesity. The Healthier Generation Benefit provides an opportunity to reduce some of the barriers that have gotten in the way of children and families being able to improve their health and their nutritional status. The Healthier Generation Benefit in particular provides families and children access to and payment for a team-based approach to obesity prevention and treatment. These children and families now have access to registered dietitians whose services have proven to be effective in obesity prevention and management. And each of the partners brings valuable expertise and resources to the table. So in the spirit of the TEAM acronym, together everyone achieves more. So thank you, Kathy. Thank you so much, Marcia, for that overview of how healthcare providers, insurers, and employers are playing a key role in improving maternal and child nutrition, both through changes and investments under the ACA and through new partner partnerships, such as the, uh, the Healthier Generation Benefit. <clears throat> Our next speaker, Jenny Bogard, is the National Healthcare Advisor with the Alliance for a Healthier Generation. And she's going to share this example of an innovative multi-sector partnership to increase access to nutritional counseling, um, as well as some initial results of their pilot project between these key players that Marcia mentioned, insurers, employers, um, and other key partners. Okay. Well, I will get started. Well, thank you to the foundation um, for giving us the opportunity to talk about this program that we have at the Alliance. And thank you to Marcia for mentioning it and introducing it and talking a little bit about the partnership that we have with the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So as Catherine mentioned, I will be talking about the Healthier Generation Benefit, which is really a landmark multi-sector partnership that improves access to childhood obesity treatment. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Alliance, we were founded by the Clinton Foundation and the American Heart Association, and we work with healthcare professionals, we work with families, we work with schools and companies and community organizations um, to really transform the conditions and systems that lead to healthier children. So the goal of 
Obesity Alliance is a nationwide prevalence of childhood obesity, but more importantly, it's really to empower children to make healthy lifestyle changes that will stay with them the rest of their lives. So why take action? Well, I'm sure most of you on the phone are aware of the statistics, but we know that nearly one in three children in the U.S. is considered overweight or obese. So if you look at the economics of that problem, um, research shows that childhood obesity alone contributes to about $14.1 billion of health care costs. When I go out and talk to insurance companies and employer groups about childhood obesity and the cost directly related to um, their businesses, what's startling is when I tell them that 80% of children who are overweight uh, between the ages of 10 and 15 are obese adults by age 25. So we know that uh, obese adults are significantly sicker than healthy weight adults, and that impacts their bottom line. So if you look back on the cost for adults, um, we know, or look forward to the cost of adults, we know that adult obesity is about $147 billion, that average additional health care expenses range anywhere between 1850 to 2741 for each person who is overweight or obese. If you look at the macro level issue, um, we know that obesity contributes to about 21% of health care costs. And research studies range anywhere from $190 billion to two, almost $210 billion. So in 2012, the Alliance worked with a market research group, and we interviewed 700 parents across the country. We asked parents a range of questions. And one of the questions we asked them was, where did they expect to find resources, trusted resources, for learning about and addressing childhood obesity? And the number one answer of this group was the doctor's office. So it beat out schools, it beat out media. Parents said they really want to get information from their pediatricians and their primary care providers on how to address childhood obesity. So what is the healthier generation benefit? Now that we know that there's an issue in the, in the prevalence and, and the cost of the system, what is the actual program? So before the benefit was in place, Traditionally, healthcare professionals were not granted access or could not talk to their patients about childhood obesity unless there was other comorbidities there. And the reason why we created this program is we know, again, that overweight children and teens are likely to develop serious health problems that will continue into adulthood. So we launched the Healthier Generation Benefit Program, where we were able to get insurance companies and large self-insured employer groups to commit to reimbursing for four follow-up visits with a primary care provider a year and four follow-up visits with a registered dietitian a year for eligible families. And we define eligibility as a child between the ages of 3 and 18 with a BMI in the 85th percentile or higher without the requirement of a comorbidity. So this program was able to bring payers together we were able to bring employers together and provider associations like the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics as well as the American Academy of Pediatrics to really create a systematic multi-sector approach to providing access to comprehensive obesity treatment. So far, our reach um, with the program is we have about 2.7 million children across the country who have access to this benefit. We also know that we have well over 56,000 provider offices who are in networks right now that are offering the benefit. Here's a list of our companies who are participating in the program. Most of them are national organizations. We have 10 insurance companies as well as 10 employer groups who are offering the benefit. As I mentioned, we partner with the provider associations like the AAP and the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And what we do through our partnership is really to create and develop tools and resources to support healthcare providers in the implementation of weight management strategies within their own practices. So we're continuing to create uh, care coordination protocols, um, webinars we offer for healthcare professionals to learn about how they can treat and manage childhood obesity within their own practices and their patients. We also work with Emory University School of Public Health they act as our third-party evaluator of the program. 
So what Emory is looking for is that they're looking at claims data. We have asked signatories in the past to send yearly claims data to Emory for them to utilize, I'm sorry, to analyze utilization of the benefits. They also conduct yearly interviews with our insurers, our employers, and provider organizations to determine barriers, challenges, opportunities within their own pilot designs of the program. And then finally, they interview and focus and do focus groups with parents um, and families to learn about their perception of a role a PCP and allied healthcare professional should have in treatment of childhood obesity. So what they found through their data collection is that they're able to determine the utilization, they're able to find best practices of implementation and utilization, as well as challenges, and also they were able to identify effective messaging for providers of the benefit. So where are we today? So we are able to collect two years of data analysis, and Emory reported out to the group um, in 2012 and 2013. So this slide right now shows findings from the 2011 analysis. And what they initially looked at with the program is that they were looking to see, you know, what were the barriers that some of our insurance companies had. As you can imagine, when we first went out to the insurance companies, a lot of them were nervous and hesitant to offer this type of preventative service program, and they thought they were really going to see some internal hurdles to get this program implemented. But what we found through the analysis and through our interviews is that there weren't that many barriers, and that it actually was quite easy to, to push it through internally at these insurance companies. And what was surprising is that when they did some internal digging, the insurers found that this is actually an expansion of some existing benefits that they had already in place. They just weren't marketing it or promoting it on a national level. We also found through this program is that one of our insurance companies actually initially required um, families to enroll in a disease management program. But what we found through the analysis is that that was actually a barrier, that families did not want to go and sign up to a program. They just wanted to have access to it. So that signatory dropped that requirement. And another signatory, which is extremely significant, eliminated not only the deductible, but the co-payment as well. So everybody on their plan can go see that physician or that registered dietitian and not have to pay a co-payment at all. They also, Emory was also able to identify promising engagement strategies. So how do we raise awareness in the healthcare provider community? Well, what they found is that offering specific webinars that talks about benefit design was very impactful for providers. They also found that strategic coordinators that interacted specifically with providers on the benefit increased awareness and increased utilization. They all, some signatories did direct meetings with hospitals and providers. And then we found that distribution of provider toolkits and benefit coding guidelines, as well as childhood obesity posters, were, were significant in raising awareness. And I will note that Valerie Spence, who will be speaking after me, Highmark was actually one of the signatories that created these really beautiful, colorful posters that they sent out to all of their provider practices throughout the state, and that was extremely impactful in raising awareness of the program. So just to go over some of the data, um, this was from 2012 data analysis. Um, as you can see, the actual identification of overweight children and obese children is still significantly lower compared to the state prevalence of childhood obesity. The signatory that saw the biggest increase was the one who allowed the broadest range of available diagnosis codes for providers. We did notice, however, that those who are identified as overweight or obese at that well child visit did come back for a fault visit. So we are seeing some um, uh, weight management um, interventions taking place among those children that were identified. As you see on this slide, the signatory with the highest increase in follow-up visits was the one who dropped those copays. So again, those families could go visit that provider completely free of charge. Looking at the RD services, um, utilization of RD services is still lower than what we would like to see. Um, the one that saw the highest increase um, and had the highest utilization of RD services is the one who actively recruited RDs to join their network and also sent lists of RDs to their members. So families were made aware of RDs within a certain radius from where they live, they're made aware of where they were located, that they could go reach out and meet with their RDs. 
So next step. So after two years of data analysis, we went back to the drawing board this summer and we really looked at the emerging trends in healthcare, notably about with the Affordable Care Act, as well as um, some integrated care delivery models. So what we are doing is we are launching the Healthier Generation Benefit 2.0 in January 2014. We're going to be piloting with our signatories an integrated care delivery model site. So if you think of pediatric collaboratives or accountable care organizations or patient center medical homes, we will be looking at specific sites and developing tailored messaging for those healthcare providers on that team. And we're going to be able to collect more detailed data from the outcomes from those specific sites. We also are moving away from claims data and looking at the HEDIS reports. What we found is that a lot of our signatories already send their HEDIS reports to NCQA to determine um, their, their, uh, how, how much further they've come in terms of collecting and measuring certain indicators. And we're looking specifically at the childhood BMI assessment, evidence of physical activity, and evidence of nutritional counseling with children. And we're also going to be focusing on a family wellness model and what that framework would look like. So what we found is that a lot of employers' health care costs come from dependents and spouses and not necessarily the employee themselves. So what we're going to be doing is working with our employer signatories on developing a framework where they could incorporate pieces of a family wellness model into their already existing wellness strategies at their companies. So again, expanding their focus to include the family unit and not just that employee. We are also excited, along with the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and the American Academy of Pediatrics, to implement a, a quality improvement project um, next year. We're going to be recruiting MD and RD teams across the country. It will be an 18-month project, and one of the strategies we're looking to um, create is how to enhance communication between physician and dietitian. Um, we're very excited about this program. In fact, we are beta testing the change package currently right now with the expectation to recruit those MDRD teams again in early Q1 of next year. And finally, we are going to be implementing a train-the-trainer pilot in North Carolina uh, next year as well, where we're going to be educating the sales team in North Carolina for a pharmaceutical company who participates in our program. We're going to be training them on the ins and outs of the benefits so that when they go and visit these physician offices, they will be able to talk to them about the program. We're going to be developing specific materials for providers in that again, that will raise awareness of the benefits, and then we're going to be engaging the office staff because we also feel that's a critical component to understanding about this benefit and knowing that this benefit out there exists. So please feel free to reach out to me. My information, you can also get it through the foundation. So thank you again for giving me the opportunity to talk about the benefits. Thanks so much, Jenny. It was really interesting to see the promising results to date from the pilot and useful to see how we can best engage providers and families going forward. And we look forward to continuing to see what you all do under this program going forward. Our final speaker from Highmark, um, as Jenny mentioned, represents one of the health plans participating in the Healthier Generation Benefit. And with us today is Valerie Spence, clinical consultant, quality management at Highmark, who will share their experience implementing the benefit and also touch on some of Highmark's other childhood obesity prevention programs. Valerie? Thank you, Catherine. I'm very honored to be with you today and share with you Highmark's ongoing commitment to addressing obesity through healthy eating and physical activity. My first slide provides a brief description of efforts prior to our affiliation with the Alliance. Beginning in 2003, Highmark collaborated with the Children's Health Fund through forums with leaders in the community. Highmark then piloted several programs, including Kids Shape, a weight loss program focusing on good nutritional choices, Spark, a program providing physical training and equipment to after-school programs, and two grant programs, a school challenge grant program and Healthy High Five, which provided money to schools to implement nutrition and physical activity programs. 
Hi, Mark. Hi, Mark also created and distributed a childhood obesity toolkit to pediatricians and family practice physicians. The toolkit provided guidance in proper nutrition for children and sample materials to use with patients. Beginning in 2006, Highmark added obesity-related preventive services. We call this our 221 benefit. Children ages 3 to 18 with a BMI percentile of 95% or higher were eligible to receive two additional physician office visits, two nutritional counseling sessions, and one set of lab work annually. These services received first dollar coverage, meaning no out-of-pocket costs to the member through copays or deductibles. We anticipated increased utilization through the elimination of cost sharing. The enhanced benefit also included adults ages 19 and older with a BMI of 30 or greater. They received the same benefit with no cost sharing. Dr. John Fisher, our Senior Vice President of Health Services, was intrigued with the work of the Alliance. He believed together we could be more effective in addressing the issues of childhood obesity through proper nutrition and exercise. Dr. Fisher signed a memorandum of agreement and Highmark joined as a signatory with the Alliance in 2011. With the new affiliation, Highmark expanded the childhood obesity benefit by lowering the eligible BMI percentile to 85% or greater and increased the number of office visits and nutritional counseling sessions to four annually. The enhanced benefit was added to the preventive schedule, which includes preventive health recommendations that receive first dollar coverage. The schedule is mailed annually to members and published on the web. The United States Preventive Services Task Force updated the recommendation addressing adult obesity, and as a result, Highmark now provides unlimited nutritional counseling sessions for adult men and women with a BMI of 30 or greater. And I'll also mention here, in August 2012, as Marcia discussed, maternal child health nutrition was positively impacted by the addition of breastfeeding counseling as a preventive benefit for women under health care reform. And in addition to counseling, breastfeeding equipment and supplies also receive first dollar coverage. Next, I'll review barriers, interventions, and results. Emory University and the Alliance interviewed 16 signatories for a research article published in the Journal of Obesity. Barriers common to most were also barriers for Highmark and include the provider lack of knowledge of the benefit and reimbursement coding, lack of access to registered dietitians, difficulty identifying eligible members due to lack of BMI documentation, lack of educational materials for providers to use with patients, and not knowing if providers actually read our notifications. To address the barrier of lack of tools, we redistributed the Childhood Obesity Toolkit and reminded providers that the contents are also available on Highmark's website. The web version is currently being updated with more nutritional counseling guidance and additional tools for use during office visits. For offices with electronic medical records, or EMRs, the BMI is automatically calculated when height and weight are entered. However, many offices still do not have EMRs and need to manually determine BMI percentile. We found that the most popular part of the toolkit was the wheel for determining BMI percentiles. Practices without EMRs told us that they really appreciated this tool. To assist with lack of member knowledge of the benefit and difficulty bringing up the subject, as Jenny mentioned, we developed a poster co-branded with the Alliance for placement in physician offices to inform members and spark a conversation. To assist with lack of knowledge for billing services, we developed a flyer that is included in provider mailings. The flyer informs practices of the diagnoses and procedure codes that are used for this benefit and provides information on how to obtain posters. It is also part of the toolkit. Currently, access to registered dietitians, or RDs, 
is limited because RDs must be employed by and billed through a credentialed provider or network facility. However, not all practices employ RDs. So in order to address this barrier, Highmark is currently making system changes to allow credentialed RDs to bill directly and to provide this service independently. Our hope is for increased utilization by making nutritional counseling more convenient to obtain. Other nutritional opportunities include seven nutritional counseling sessions, telephonic or on-site, that are available free of charge as a value-added benefit. Session sites include local grocery stores where members can learn about good nutritional choices. Children with CHIP health insurance receive additional nutritional counseling through a disease management program that works directly with the child's pediatrician. Members and physicians are reminded of the benefits through electronic and print media. Benefits are highlighted, or they were highlighted, as part of a local television program on WQED promoting healthy lifestyle choices for children, focusing on the importance of nutrition and food choices. In addition, our own Dr. Gessler participated in an Alliance-sponsored webinar focusing on health plan reimbursement for services that address obesity. It is still available for CME credit on the Alliance website. Highmark's most recent collaboration began in 2012 with the United Way in an initiative titled Fit United. Communities in Allegheny County are mobilized to contribute in a variety of ways to motivate kids to healthy habits through nutrition and exercise. We are using Fit United as a vehicle to promote Alliance benefits. And these are just a few examples of contributions from individuals and businesses that help make this program a success. And here is an example for using social media to inspire and encourage healthy lifestyle choices. Alliance benefits are also promoted here. We compared results from 2010 to 2012 and discovered that one preventive visit for obese children increased from 42% to 81%. Coding for obesity and more than one visit for obesity also nearly doubled, while nutritional counseling slightly decreased, but these numbers remained small. So some possible next steps are to solicit and incorporate provider feedback into our outreach and interventions. Also, Highmark is currently building medical malls in several high population areas. We are exploring the addition of wellness centers within medical malls to provide obesity-related services. In addition, we ran a report to see if we could find a practice with high utilization to use as a best practice model. However, none stood out as frequently billing for these services. Since research shows better outcomes when directly conversing with providers, we can explore education through our provider representatives and our clinical client relations team. We've learned through the years that our work continues to evolve as we seek to support opportunities for members to make healthy lifestyle choices. For more information, I've listed websites on this final slide, and they, all the slides will be available in the future. Um, and that's the conclusion of my presentation, and thank you very much. The prevention efforts, new commitment to arming providers, parents, and families with education and tools is really evident through your participation in this pilot, um, as well as your broader um, childhood obesity efforts. So thanks so much for sharing all of that with us today. At this time, we can open it up for questions and answers. So I'm going to ask our operator to come back on, and, and she'll explain how you can ask a question if you're joining us by phone. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, please signal by pressing the star key, followed by the digit 1 
on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. If you have signaled for a question prior to hearing these instructions on today's call, please repeat the process now by pressing star 1 again to ensure our equipment has captured your signal. We'll pause for just a moment to allow everyone an opportunity to signal for questions. And the first question comes from Stephen Cook. Please go ahead, sir. Hello. Thank you for the presentation. And I put my question in here. I wasn't sure if I'd still be on. Uh, the last speaker had mentioned the medical malls. And I wonder if you could explain that, um, uh, kind of what that concept is. As we've tried to reach providers, um, it's much easier to reach them from a regional standpoint as opposed to a specific benefit or plan standpoint. Um, hi, Stephen. The, the, the idea behind the medical mall is to pro provide comprehensive care to members, that there would be a variety of providers that would be um, available to provide care um, in one location. So that's actually the plan. It's, it, a lot of it is still in the planning stages, so it's early, but that's the idea behind it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if there are any additional questions, please press star 1 at this time. There are no further questions on the phone line. Please continue. Okay, we will address some questions that have been submitted through the web, and you can just interrupt me if anyone um, dials in with any questions. Um, we had quite a few questions about the access to registered dietitians. And um, Valerie, you touched on some of those strategies and ways that Highmark is thinking about increasing access. So maybe you could expand on that. And I don't know if, if Jenny could expand at all on what some of the other plans might be doing. But the basic question is about you know the limited number of RD referrals and, and how that related to the limited resources for that service, especially as a barrier um, in some rural <clears throat> areas, and what are the opportunities for increasing access to RDs going forward? And this is Jenny, I, and Marcia, feel free to jump in. So I, I will tell you, um, there there is lots of uh, dialogue taking place right now between insurers across the country and determining if there is sufficient coverage of RDs, especially in the rural areas. Um, and I will tell you through our partnership with the Academy of Nutrition Dietetics, when this issue or this question is raised, we work with the state chapters to make sure that there is, in fact, sufficient coverage, and we will work with that insurance company in that state to increase um, the number of RDs within their network. That said, um, on a more broader scale, through the quality improvement project, that's one of the things we're looking at is how do we um, increase awareness from a pediatrician perspective on the number of RDs that are available in that community and those that can work with pediatric patients. Um, so part of the QI project connecting these MDs with these RDs within their own communities and working with them through over the course of the 18 months will be included, those outcome of that will be included in this change package strategy. Um, Marcia, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yes, Jenny, this is Marcia. I would like to add, Jenny's captured a lot of the conversations very well. As she said, we're aware of it. We do our best. Sometimes there are dietitians available, but the uh, physician community doesn't really know where to find them, so that's where we team up together to try to help with that. But certainly in the rural areas, provider shortages are concerned, not just for dietitians, but for other healthcare professionals. And so one of the ideas that um, we've tossed out to the, to the insurer groups and employer groups is the idea of offering the benefit maybe as a telehealth service so we can do a better job of increasing access to dietitians 
in those rural areas, and it also applies to urban areas where there just may be transportation limitations or time limitations because we know families tell us they're busy and adding more and more appointments into an already busy schedule can be a challenge. So we're hoping that we can work together to explore some of these different models for providing a service beyond just the traditional face-to-face -face office encounter. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we had a, a few other questions um, come in, and I don't, this might maybe be something that Marsha maybe could speak to, but I guess some, some people are trying to understand, um, you know, we're really specifically talking today about people that have private insurance and expanding access to nutritional counseling, but, um, you know, Marsha, could you speak to at all um, sort of access to this type of counseling for folks that are not on private insurance, either through Medicaid or, or through other um, health clinics that serve the uninsured? Sure. Um, that's always an interesting question, and it's certainly a challenge that's out there. Uh, when you get out of the private insurance world, Medicaid program, um, it varies state by state in terms of what they do, what they need to cover. One of the things we didn't talk about was the fact that some of these preventive services provisions that we spoke about in the context of the private plans and the Affordable Care Act also apply to Medicaid programs as well. And so um, I think we're seeing more movement in states to expand services to address childhood obesity, um, but there's a lot of variation from state to state, and it certainly gets wrapped up in the politics of Medicaid expansion as well. Um, so that's probably the simplest way to address it. When you get into services and, and facilities that serve the uninsured, um, once again, there's a lot of variation in terms of what services they provide Right now, I'm not aware of any requirements they have that says you have to have dietitians there or you have to provide nutrition counseling. Um, you know, there are some guidelines in terms of screening and making referrals, but how that gets executed in practice, there's certainly wide variation, and I think it really boils down to what an individual facility or program um, sees as valuable to the population they're serving and what resources they have in the community to be able to meet those needs. Um, there are opportunities through public health systems. One of the things we didn't talk about was the WIC program, or Women, Infants, and Children, which is a federal program for pregnant women, infants, and children up to six years of age that provides some food support but also nutrition education. And so um, there are a lot children and mothers who are getting nutrition services through that program. Great, thank you. And if I can just add real quick, um, we do have some of our um, insurance companies who are offering the benefit do offer this benefit to their Medicaid populations as well. Great. Another question we had was about whether there's any tools or education that's provided through this program to help physicians who might be living in areas that are designated as food deserts or where there's a lack of access to healthy food for their patients and how the providers and, and the RDs really can help parents and families address these issues. And is that question for the Alliance, as part of the, ben the Healthier Generation Benefit? Yes. Well, I, yeah, sure. or for Highmark, I guess, what, like how through, if there's any way through the program to help providers um, that are encountering, you know, patients and families that are saying they don't have, you know, access to more nutritious food. Sure. So from the Alliance perspective, we have not focused on that particular aspect. We focus some of the trainings that we provide to healthcare professionals right now focus on um, weight bullying, 
um, developing that effective team with an, another allied healthcare professional, um, identifying success stories of how to access, successfully implement weight management. We have approached the subject of food deserts, um, particular to this program yet. Um, if that is an area where we feel that is a lot of interest from healthcare providers, we're more than happy to, to offer a webinar on that. But as far as the benefits are concerned, we have not focused on that. Now, that's not to say if particular signatories haven't done some training for their providers and networks, and I'll pass over to Val to see if Highmark has focused on that. Um, no, this is Val. That's not something that we have focused on. Okay. And, th and this is this is Marcia from the Academy. I just like to to chime in. It's definitely an interesting concept, and we've been looking more and more at uh, what we call the hunger obesity paradox because there are certainly children and adults who are overweight, um, but it's it's because they don't have access to the right foods. Um, so they could actually be hungry but overweight. It's an interesting situation. So. Um, while it hasn't been addressed specifically through the Alliance and the work that we're doing, I think I can speak from our end as the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. We certainly have information and resources and training for our members on the issue, and they can certainly serve as a resource for the other providers and the families within their communities. So I would say that um, the physician providers who are seeing families through this benefit, it's another way that they can benefit from teaming up with the dietitian and trying to address it um, within their patient population. But there's certainly a lot more work I imagine we can do on that front. Okay, thank you. Um, another question sort of related to um, people living in, you know, different uh, parts of the country is, about whether any of the educational materials or presentations were, were culturally adapted for the target populations, and if so, how were they adapted? So because it's a national program, um, all the materials that we create, we have to kind of have the focus of, you know, it being nationally. Um, we, that said, we work with signatories if they wanted us to develop tailored messaging for their um, populations that they serve. Um, but from a national perspective and things that we have up online that are available to healthcare providers, it's not a particular focus on any one demographic or another outside of the fact that the messaging that we create for families is at a family length. Uh, it, it's, it's created for families to understand at a very low level. Um, I don't know if Marsha at the Academy has developed anything uh, for particular demographics, but the Alliance, we have to keep it at a very um, broad um, uh, messaging because it is a national program. Sure. Yes, yes, Jenny, this is Marsha. I would say that, once again, um, from our end, resources specific to nutrition care for childhood obesity as well as, you know, other populations, we do try to provide some materials that are tailored to different um, cultural and ethnic populations. Great. Um, another question uh, submitted online says, much of the primary care provided in rural urban settings where there's also higher rates of obesity is provided by physician assistants and nurse practitioners. Would reimbursement of these services um, pertain to these kinds of providers in the future or only to MDs? So for us, we don't limit it to the MD right now. It's a primary care provider. So if it is mm -hmm. that nurse practitioner or that physician assistant or even that internist, we understand um, that some families don't have access to a pediatrician um, depending on where they're located. So we open that up to a primary care provider. Um, and this is Val from Highmark, and I did touch on this um, in the slides that um, it, where we have credentialed providers and facilities, and if those um, subspecialties would be employed by the credentialed provider facility, then that would be reimbursable. Great. Another question. Um, is have any of your groups engaged in medical schools to pair up training of medical 
students with our D students? So that is a fantastic question and something that we are doing outside of the Healthier Generation Benefit is we are working with the Bipartisan Policy Center and the American College of Sports Medicine on looking at medical school curriculum reform and how do we engage medical schools, residency programs, and fellowship programs on incorporating formal nutrition counseling um, and working with our insurance companies in specific states. So more to come on that in 2014. Um, initially, we will be uh, releasing a white paper that will be um, published in probably the latest by February of next year. Great. Another question, and maybe I'll direct this to Marsha. We have um, a registered dietitian who <clears throat> submitted a question uh, just asking about how to get the word out to physicians um, and try to connect better, um, you know, either through this specific benefit program or just in general to support more collaboration between uh, RDs and uh, primary care. Sure. Um, I love that question because it's been a big focus of work that we've been doing at the academy um, and trying to support our members in that area. So as a few examples, I would say we recently, or in the past year, have developed two different toolkits and some webinars around some of those toolkits that focus on this concept of primary care provider and dietitian relationships and collaboration. So I would encourage any registered dietitian to definitely um, be thinking that way about forging new and different types of relationships with the care providers and accessing the resources that we have within the academy with, we've got, like I said, webinars, toolkits, um, one-page informational sheets that can be used for marketing purposes for that reason. Um, and we're going to be doing more and more in that area to help members work on those collaborations. So the easiest way to find them is at www.eatright.org forward slash shop. There's a section on nutrition services coverage products or they can reach out to me individually and I can connect them with those resources and other things that we have available. Great, thank you. Um, I can't read the full question online, unfortunately, but we have a question generally asking about connections with school-based health centers and if there's any opportunities to involve them. They're not a primary care provider, but have a captive audience for programs and tools, you know, might be a way to connect um, kids to, to this type of nutritional counseling. Can anyone comment on that? So in terms of the healthier generation benefit, um, it's hard to engage school health centers because those students have different insurance plans. They're not all under one insurance coverage. However, um, we do work in healthy schools. I'm sorry, we do work in schools through our Healthy Schools program. We're in over 20,000 schools across the country in all 50 states. And we work directly with schools on creating healthier environments. And there's seven different curriculum points um, and part of, as, that comprises a framework um, that schools have to implement, and some of those, some of those um, points focus on nutrition and um, the food that's offered in the schools, as well as employee engagement and wellness. Hi, and this, this is this is Marcia. I'm just looking Go. at the Fit United website. Um, it's listed on the last slide. Uh, because that collaboration between the United Way and multiple partners, actually a lot of their interventions are focused on schools. And there are a lot of great ideas and um, suggestions uh, you could get from what they're currently doing. And this is Marsha. I'll add to that mix because I think everybody's recognized the school environment as being an important one when it comes to looking at the nutrition and health of children because of the time kids spend in school. Um, so adding to the mix through the academy, through our foundation, we have what's called Kids Eat Right. And 
through that program, we have uh, some pilot programs and some very well-established programs going on in some school districts across the country where they're utilizing nutrition coaches to um, integrate within the school system, not only through the food side of things, but the physical activity side of things to address childhood obesity. So you can go to www.kidseatright.org for more information about the efforts that are going on there that complement um, the efforts that Jenny and Val have both talked about. Um, another question submitted online was whether there's any expectation that the benefit may be modified to include children who are not <clears throat> at the 85% threshold but are trending toward overweight in the future. So when we created the benefit program, we wanted to focus on childhood obesity prevention, early treatment to stop the upward trend of BMI, so kids who otherwise would be considered healthy but are maybe at that 85th, 87th percentile um, would get into an early intervention. That said, um, we don't limit it. So some of our signatories actually do offer to any child between the ages of 3 and 18 um, and encourage them to work with an RD if there are some issues that their primary care provider have, has identified. Um, so we keep it open. Those are the very bare minimum requirements we have for the program, but we encourage and support any of our signatories who open it up to a broader range of children. Great, thank you. Um, another question uh, probably for Jenny also is, is generally of wanting to know about the evaluation plans going forward for the benefit. and. Um, you know, the specific person wanted to find out more about kind of the ROI for offering this type of benefit in their plan or for an employer. Sure, sure. So we know that the ROI is a very hard thing to prove when you're looking at childhood obesity because, you know, lowering BMI takes quite a long time. And when a child, again, is otherwise not sick, um, and may not have any comorbidities yet, it's very hard to make that argument. I think if you look at longer-term studies and what I mentioned earlier in my PowerPoint slide, if you look at, we know that 80% of kids between the ages of 15 do become obese adults by 25, and we know that obese adults are significantly sicker than healthy weight adults, that you can kind of start making the connection there. In terms of the benefit program evaluation, as I mentioned, we're moving away from the claims data. We're going to be looking at HEDIS and trying to increase the fidelity of measurement around BMI and assessment um, with insurance companies. I didn't get into too much detail on this presentation because of the time limitations, but Emory also does um, other pilot work as part of this program. So last year, they interviewed parents um, that were looking at um, interviewing parents to understand the perception that they have of the role that their PCP NRD should play in, their, in terms of their child's weight management. But also, Emory is doing a case study implementation where they're diving deeper into specific signatory pilot design to determine best practices and how they were so successful in implementing the benefit. And then through these integrated care delivery sites, Emory's goal is to really be able to look at that outcome data and specifically looking at lowering BMI. So they will be collecting surveys, analyze, I'm sorry, surveying parents, interviewing parents and providers at that site and collecting data from the medical charts um, going forward. So we hope in the next two to three years, as it, it will take probably six months to a year to implement um, the, the pilot in these uh, integrated care delivery sites. So probably in the next two to three years, we'll be able to have a lot more detailed data. Great. That's fantastic. Thanks for sharing that. Um, operator, are there any more questions from our audience? I think we've um, addressed most of the, the online questions at this point. Can I just say one more thing? I'm sorry. I just wanted to make note that, you know, this would not be possible without the support and participation of all the insurance companies. Um, you know, we work with the providers, but without their commitment to addressing this critical issue and agreeing to reimburse, 
we would not be where we are today. And we at the Alliance are always looking to add new signatories, new insurance companies, new employer groups to the program. So if anybody is out there and interested in offering this and what would like to learn more information, please feel free to contact me. I'm happy to talk to you about it in more detail. Great. Thank you so much for that. And I guess I'll ask uh, the other two speakers if they have any closing comments or advice they would they would give to our audience who's working in this, this topic area. Well, this is, this is Marcia. I really think this idea of what the healthier generation benefit represents, I mentioned in my slide and Jenny expanded on it. It's the whole concept of taking a village to address things. And it takes a village to raise children. It takes a village to raise healthy children. And so this concept of bringing the various segments together to try to address the issue is very important. And certainly, there are more segments um, or spheres of influence beyond employers, insurers, Jenny's group, our group, the American Academy of Pediatrics, because people have already talked about other environmental influences that play a role in the health and well-being of, of children and families. But this concept of recognizing we all have a part to play and stepping up to the plate to do our share and be creative and think about different ways that we can approach things I think is really important and certainly the questions that people had about addressing things earlier before it becomes a problem, certainly prevention is so critical. And if we can do things so that our children don't become obese in the first place or become overweight in the first place, and if we take good care of our mothers and the entire family, fathers as well, I think we're really going to all reap the benefits from it. So I encourage everybody to think about the role they can play in the partnership. Um, and this is Bell. I would add that um, if anyone's thinking of beginning on this journey, not to be overwhelmed, um, because it is a learning experience, um, which is constantly providing us with opportunities for improvement. Um, so I would just say, you know, if you just get started, um, it will eventually all come together and not to get discouraged, but to just view uh, the whole process as um, providing you with opportunities to do better.